So my dear and dearest friends, Sunday has come. The day of the sun. The day of this wonderful meeting coming to an end in the Easter holiday, Easter Mela. I'm so happy because so many children have come here. But I'm not happy enough not being able to dedicate enough energy to the younger generations. This is a very great responsibility to make the children the most happy. Because we old people, we already have had it all. We danced in all the holy places. We ate prashadam in all the holy temples. <laughs> but still we demand more. But the new generations have to be looked at very carefully for their or our common benefit. And what to speak if you have little little babies just born, the newcomers who just poked their nose into this current <coughs> birth on earth. <laughs> <clears throat> they are looking out with great surprise. What am I to expect in this world? <clears throat> How do I prepare for being someone successful in this world? It's a tough one, you know? It's a tough world. I see all the kids sitting there with a smartphone. I think, where am I? Where did I? end up in this world, you know. <laughs> and <coughs> even a little bit helpless one feels. But I understood that the helplessness is a good key for good prayer. <coughs> when you feel helpless, then you start chanting Hare Krishna with fervor, with true, with true shelter taking. You see, we all in our lives, we have so many tasks to fulfill. Sometimes we feel overburdened by the tasks. <coughs> if you ever experience that, then I'm not surprised because I'm feeling it all the time overburdened with tasks and nevertheless we love our tasks and just look at this I mean by age I would almost say that the over 40 are in the in the majority <coughs> so when you're meeting with a bunch of people over 40, over 50. My God, what expectation they have. What experience they have. So all this is bringing us to, <coughs> to a deep reflection and the need of dear deepest prayer because I don't see any other way out of here except to learn how to pray purely. And that's what the scriptures give us. They give us all these incredible encouragements that we should chant the holy names of the Lord in a humble state of mind, considering ourselves lower than the straw in the street. Things like that, no? More tolerant than a tree ready to give respect to everybody else without expecting any anything in return. No shlokamrita. There are so many special gifts, you know. And the holy name of all the gifts is the greatest gift. We have, of course, we have the 
we have the whole village of beautiful instructions for simple living and high thinking given to us by Prabhupada. No, that was fantastic. Prabhupada was so kind to give us so much uh, information. But anyhow, the essence of all is that how we approach the holy name of Krishna. And here's one shloka. <coughs> this is from Chaitanya Chaitamita, Madhyalila. It says, Shraddha Shakti Vishvasha Kai Shudrita Nishchaya Krishna Bhakti Kai Nishalva Karma Kritai. The word Shraddha means very firm confidence that simply by performing bhakti to Sri Radha Krishna, all other activities are automatically performed. So, when we're feeling overburdened, we should just chant Hare Krishna and worship Radha Krishna. Then, something special will happen to us. We will grow internally. In the Gaudiya line, the meaning of Shraddha is giving as follow, followed in the Amnaya Sutra. Shraddha Tvanyo Payavarjam Bhakti Unmukhi Chitavdhiti Vishesha. Shraddha is the special propensity of the heart that strives towards bhakti alone. It is totally devoid of karma and jnana and desires nothing other than to give pleasure to Krishna. The internal symptom of faith is Krishna Seva Vashana, the desire to serve Krishna favorably. So, Srila Bhakti Laka Srila Maharaj He said that Shraddha is the halo of Radha. He says Sacha Charanapati Laksha The external symptom of Shraddha is known as Sharanagati, taking shelter of Sri Hari. Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami says, Shraddha is the absence of doubt. It is an atomic particle of prema, the first ray of prema. And Srila Bhakti Raghavakshila Maharaj says, Shraddha is the halo of Srimata Radhika, by the light of which others may understand Krishna. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna makes many references to <coughs> Shraddha. In my own work, I would call it uh, spiritual social work, I came across so many times people who could not give up smoking marijuana. Even though they knew the philosophy even though they could understand that this will not help them and all that, you didn't really have to do much preaching to them, philosophically speaking. And still they could not get rid of this uh, attachment to intoxication. So because of that I was pretty desperate. <clears throat> and I was looking, there must be an answer. There must be a way to, to go beyond these, these silly attachments. As a matter of fact, Sri Vashrita Maharaj had said, giving up marijuana, he said, that's nothing. Wait when you come to Kanara Kamini and Pratishta. That's difficult to give up. Attachment to money, attachment to sexuality, and attachment to fame, name and fame that you don't do things for name and fame, but you do things for the service of your Lord. So, that is 
that is the real tough test. So <clears throat> I was pretty frustrated that how some people cannot even give up such simple uh, bad habit like intoxication. That time I turned myself a little bit to psychology. And I said, what psychology has to say about all this? How they, do they preach it? How do they approach it? And at that time, I came in contact with the logotherapy of Viktor Frankl. And I was amazed because what I knew about psychology, that was more or less what Prabhupada said about Freud and other things like that. And what we had known of psychoanalysis of the modern days and a few others coming up with different ways that we can adapt to the tasks or the trials of society, that how we can deal with them. And so I wasn't very charmed by it. I was much more charmed by the teachings of Srila Prabhupada, obviously. So, but when I started to read Viktor Frankl and his explanation that the person will not be happy if he doesn't see the meaning of his life. All happiness or distress turns around that feeling, the inner fulfillment that what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to do. And that approach or that uh, conviction, that inner conviction opens many, many doors. So I became very interested. I say, how does it work? What is the meaning of life? And of course, the meaning of life it must include the total phenomena of life. It cannot only be related to uh, doing some nice little social helping work at that moment. There must be much more to it. There must be a spiritual dimension. Then Viktor Frankl said, but the psychologist, his job is not to give the religion to the person. I said, then how does it work? You're supposed to give them a meaning of life. The meaning of life for a father is to raise his kid. The meaning of life of a, uh, of a mayor of a town is to make the town run nicely. This is too, too, too superficial. It must go deeper. So I said, Viktor Frankl, he was from a uh, Jewish background. So, but he, said he, he stopped the logotherapy there. He said, just stimulate people, give them something to hang on to and to, to they don't take this away. He, he was in Auschwitz, Viktor Frankl. He survived Auschwitz and he said the only people who could survive Auschwitz were the people who had a very strong faith. So then I kept developing this thought. How much and what can faith do for us? And I said if we cannot give a particular religion to people, in order to help them as a coach or as a counselor, at least we can give them a deep religiosity. So I went deeper into the subject, what is original, original faith? What is original truth? What, what are original laws? And also that brought me in contact with the indigenous people because they have a very strong belief in the original manifestation of things as it is being conceived by them in different cultures in different ways but in, in essence very very similar to the Vedic thought of life. So that was very good for me because my faith became much more strong because I was educated properly just like you <clears throat> that anything from forefathers and from ancient tribes is just some primitive babbling. No? 
like some Neanderthalers in a cave scratching the, the earth and then the first sunlight comes and says, oh, what's that, you know? And like, like, like primitive babbling, that has been like kind of what they have converted, uh, uh, what they have given to us about our ancestors. I mean, all the way down to say probably they were monkeys at some point and then they got a little bit, their heads grew a little bit and they got a little bit more brain in its skull and, and all of a sudden they discovered all kinds of things. That's how I was brought up. And you know the story, I won't go into the details because uh, one of the details which takes the people to think that uh, Human beings have to be bred. You must have heard about the eugenics concept, which came from Charles Darwin's uh, <coughs> nephew, that we should breed good human beings, because our human beings are just not well bred. So we have too many things we should uh, root. Anyhow, this all is stupidity. So, with this prejudice of that, because if you have that notion, that conviction, then it's very difficult to have faith in the wisdom of the past. <coughs> that is, uh, that is something which, when I was looking for the original law and the original uh, spirituality, which is inborn, God-given, it is there in the, with the soul, it comes with the jiva. What is that jiva all about? Where does he come from? Why is he here? What is he aspiring? And then you find that this connection with the invisible world is of highest concern to him. And if that connection with the invisible world is not answered to him, he will completely be, he will feel lost. So the original spirituality, which is there, this, this, this has to be promoted in the educational system. Now, what are we doing? We are doing just that. We are promoting this faith in the invisible, in our possible access to it through the holy name, through the scriptures and this and that. We are actually practicing this local <coughs> therapy, or which I then called it Oida <coughs> therapy, because it was the key to knowledge which is conviction, which is in essence what you believe. And you have nothing else except what you believe. You cannot access strength from anything which you don't believe. Therefore when you say, I know, actually you mean to say, I think I know. So that's what we got in, that, in the teachings of uh, Socrates. He said, the only thing I know that I don't know anything. And, uh, and that is peculiarly, that's where I took the name from Oida, it, Oides, that he said, there is, there is, I know, is not the fulfillment, but there is something invisible. It's like in the Sanskrit, we call it the spota. Spota means, is the reality behind the words. The reality inside of the feelings of the having realized in our consciousness something and trying to convey it to others. <coughs> this is also a game. Like when you practice bhakti yoga, you have sadhana. That is a great spiritual experience. So then we realized after a while that the oida therapy was actually spirituality in its very soft approach, especially for those who were contaminated by the information, by the educational system, saying that spirituality is primitive. 
Spirituality is superstition. Super spirituality is a weakness. You have to be strong, you have to be armed, you have to go for it. Hmm? Why are you wasting your time praying and meditation? Are you crazy? You need to get the best job in the market and make the most money and buy the most items. That is the success of life, man. So this is how people are being trained up in this common current world. And the world is very much in despair because they realize it really doesn't work. It doesn't really produce healthy environments and situations. Corruption in the world is on such a top high level that anybody who has a chance to steal some money is, is almost like a 90% chance that he will. So, <laughs> and there may be a few ones in between there. They don't do it because they feel they have an honor of their own. But it's terrible, you know, the world. And because of that, environmentally, we are the worst disaster because the politicians, they sell Mother Earth. They sell the areas for monocultures. They sell the areas for mining. They sell the, the rivers. They sell everything. Anything which gives money into their pocket, they do it. And they do it behind closed doors. And the international trade agreements, they're the worst and the dirtiest type of arrangements made just for the rich and become rich, the poor the poor. Same old story. So, because the world of exploitation is promoted as the top solution for growth, therefore, anybody who has another way of looking at it, simple living, high thinking and all that stuff, you know, <laughs> he's being looked upon like mm, hippie. He must be a hippie or something, you know. Uh, and uh, coming back to the faith, the faith and Oida therapy is if I want to help others to overcome many of their difficulties, I first of all have to help them to believe in their own ability to connect with the helping source, which is themselves, their consciousness, their own consciousness. <coughs> like we were reading in Vedanta Sutra, that is the only way to have experience, that is the only way to get Anubhav. And Anubhav is feeling, essentially. is what you feel drives you. You had a feeling you wanted to come to this Mela. And it was so strong that you made all the arrangements that you came here. And I hope you leave feeling, oh, that was a good investment of my time and Lakshmi, so that I went to this Mela. And definitely, uh, for me, it was most wonderful to see you all. I only lament <coughs> not having not have enough time to listen to you all because we had so many programs and the, uh, the time is very restricted what to do. Anyhow, back to OIDA therapy. So I was thinking Shraddha is the sacred gift of God. Therefore God will also take personally care for anybody who will approach him. So some or other we have to overcome that limitation which secular thinking imposes upon people. So I realized, first, the first book on Oida therapy, I based very much on what I learned from my guru. And it was uh, an explanation how the Vedic teachings of the guru answers to the needs. Karma, reincarnation, and all these things, how the Vedas answer these and give us a good inspiration for having a good spiritual life. And I presented that in India in a congress of, of uh, um, psychology and spirituality. And oh, it was interesting to see with a therapy something people can uh, raise their eyebrows 
but nobody can defeat it. So I, I, I got a few eye, eyebrows raised and then kind of. Then I came back to the West and I showed that book to people in the West, that book which I published in India. And the people in the West said, oh, oh, now you want to make us all Hindus or what? And I realized the idea was fantastic, but if I wanted to present OIDA therapy and all this to the Western uh, world, I would have to substitute that direction from the spiritual East into what Prabhupada and Sri Ramaj used, the common sense. So we had to create an academic platform to show how beneficial faith is for people in this world and how without faith people are very slipping left and right and having no, no capacity to organize their life. So I had to bring all kinds of documentation to this effect and use my common sense and I, I was very happily rewarded because as I was going deeper into the subject I found that there was plenty evidence <laughs> that a human being without faith in the invisible, into the uh, real meaning of life, etc., is really kind of a very poverty-stricken person and very <coughs> desperate and falling easily into passion and ignorance rather than getting strength in goodness to grow and to grow towards higher understanding. From that arose the understanding of the healing circle that we all can be benefited when we start evaluating our consciousness, our activities according to some guidelines. And of course this is a process which actually almost you have to do it yourself with yourself. It's not so much that you do that with somebody else unless he's uh, really, really eager to get your particular help on it. But it's, it's very much a, a meditation, a self-reflection. And then I discovered by, by presenting it on the basic logical terms, it started opening the doors everywhere. And the people became more eager to uh, include it uh, in, in the pattern of thinking. In other words, the secular world could not reject the proposals of OIDA therapy. And that was, a, uh, well, that was a key moment, because secular world is not supposed to be prejudiced. Secular, secular, secular world is to, supposed to be neutral. But the consumer society have hijacked the secularism, have turned it into an instrument of competition and consuming to the maximum degree under the plea of fast development and all this. So what secularism uh, was in its beginning, it was the defense of humanity towards fundamentalism of especially the Abrahamic religions whose fundamentalism was killing, submitting, exploiting in any way you can in order to make yourself superior to others. Boom. That was really tough. In other words, you could say that what we are fighting today, that secularism, was the saving grace for humanity to be in the grip of Abrahamic uh, religions destroying Mexico, destroying Central America, destroying South America, North America, Asia, Australia. Everywhere they went, they would establish their uh, sword, sword philosophy or whatever. And, and that was the, the plight of this world. So thanks to the secularism, screaming, <clears throat> no more of this garbage. We want to be able to think on our own and have our own criteria. You go to hell with your, with your impositions, with your tyrannies in the realm of thought. 
Because that's what fundamentalism of Abrahamic religion is. It's tyranny. Hey, you submit to yourself here, or hell is sure, and we make sure you get hell right away. You don't have to wait for going there. Uh, so, my God, you know, how could the world save himself from that? And that's why the spirit, the anti-religious spirit in our modern kids today is so deep-rooted. Because now, they not only can see what was the wrong idea, they can also see what the wrong idea did with humans or what did humans do with others under the wrong ideas. And when you see that, you say, hey, hey, give me a break. I mean, I am, I am who I am, but I don't want to be of them, part of them in any way associated, even though these guys are your forefathers, my dear. There, you, there's something, somehow that you have to deal with it. Because, do you want to heed to colonialistic aspects? Number one, law. In law, we still heed to the concept of the right of righteousness of conquest. It's still there. If I now pull, pull out a huge gun and I put it on the head of all the Austrians and tell them, Austria is no war. Now you belong to Finland or you die. And then the Austrians will say, well, we prefer to become Finland than dying. So, okay. Now, if I have a, a gun big enough to do that, and get by, then Austria would disappear from the, uh, from the map. It will all be finished. They all will have to learn Finnish. <laughs> and that's called the law of conquest. And that law of conquest is not removed from the books of Den Haag. In other words, when they, when they have an international judgment the number one concern is who has the power. Who, who, who can say, you have to do what I say because I got the power. That will be considered first before the righteousness is concerned. <clears throat> and because we have not eliminated that from our books of law, then you can imagine how they can understand spirituality. It's, a, it's not... It's not reachable to them. The, the colonialism of today is so well structured, is so well structured and it has totally taken possession of the educational system. The, the, the educational system in the world is completely based on colonialism. And those who try to escape from it Oh, they make sure that you look like some ridiculous fellow who wants to, like, uh, again, they will say you're just a bunch of hippies. Huh? What do you want? You want to change the world, bring everybody back to nature, put everybody back in a cave. Huh? You're the, you have the caveman philosophy. But we have the philosophy of structuring the world high tech solutions for everything. So we have an extreme, very extreme schizophrenic situation of a self-destructive lifestyle versus a, a rather crude version of understanding that we can be happy without so much stuff. Hmm? Because that's kind of the other way of looking. We can be happy without so much stuff. We can be happy with small little houses. We don't have to have mansions, each one of us. And, 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 and. We can be happy with a bicycle. We don't need everyone in a car. And the cars are, so, the, the roads are so full that it takes you three hours from your house to go into town. <laughs> Things like that, you could walk probably faster. <coughs> so, 
how to live happy with less, how to do that. And even the, the capitalistic consumer society is deadly scared when people buy less. They're, they have entire departments in university studying how to encourage the people to spend all the money they're making and not saving so much. So it's, it's a very, we are living in a very schizophrenic situation. And in that situation, without any faith in anything invisible, casual, you get lost. You get lost in drugs, you get lost in greed, you get lost in crime, you get lost in corruption, you go, get, go and get lost in illicit so-called pleasures. And that's what the situation is. So Shraddha is coming to our help. This is the subject which inspired the Oedo therapy. And as it teaches the principle of spirituality rather than a particular spirituality it brings people to a very internal happiness because they can discover that their insight is trustworthy their feeling and inclination towards a path of light and enlightenment is very appropriate, is very positive. Then, from there on, they can go their ways, safe. Now, we have included in our OIDA therapy a few little, little gifts, extra gifts. And one of them is vegetarianism. We show in rational way to people that your past will be hampered if you still sustain slaughterhouses. And it is so rational and well presented that people cannot resist it. It's true. If we want to go that way, we have to stop killing, mass killing of animals, etc. So in this way, because we're working the healing circle, those tamasic and rajasic influences in this world are actually becoming clear. It, it, the people start having an awareness about it. And that is a very important thing. And like for example, if you speak or work on the basis of OIDA therapy, you will be surprised that those who are atheists don't really exist in essence, but those who claim they're atheists, within, within <coughs> minutes we get them to talk about God favorably. Why? Because in Oida therapy the first and foremost concept is respect to the shrine of others. If you want to be respected with your faith, but you have to respect the face of others. Just think about the impact of that. Because basically in our world of self-righteousness, we are going through the world saying, <clears throat> I'm right because I think I'm right. And this gives me the right to deal with you as if you are wrong. And if you are wrong and I am right, then you have to do what I say, basically. <clears throat> so this kind of foolish, mundane <clears throat> consideration, that is, that is what happens with the people when they have not, not an awakening of the secrets of Shraddha, of faith, of understanding that we need, this is our tool. Our tool is not any political system. It's not any educational garbage they want to stuff into your head in the schools. No, the treasure of your own self-determination 
is your connection with everything, even with the infinite. So be very solid, strong, happy about that ability within you, which is connected to what you don't know it is. It is the infinite. Shraddha is the halo of Radha Rani, Sri Ramaj say. The halo. She gives you access to believe in the creator, in the beloved meaning of everything in and around you, and that you are supposed to relate to it positively, progressively, gratefully, compassionately. That is, this is, this is a very spiritual thing. I mean, we learn them in Krishna consciousness that Okay, you accept the spiritual master, now you become a vegetarian, now you're not supposed to lie, now you're not supposed to do so many things, because that's already because you've got a guru and you accept the guru, but that's a very high stage. The great amount of people, they don't have, even have an idea that the guru could exist, because if you tell them guru, they go priest, no. Mm -hmm. Thanks. They immediately, it's eliminated on their level of prejudice. So therefore, it is so important that they get confidence in their faith and confidence in what is there, which they don't know anything about, but they want to know. So then, after this has been established in the mind of a person, he has to respect, this is not a mind. he has to respect all others without a question of a doubt. So if I don't believe in God, okay, I have my doubts about it. But you believe in God, I must respect you. Therefore, through Oida therapy, the topic of of an understanding of a divine cause is immediately opened. And if you then bring in the, the original tribal contributions, you'll be surprised. <coughs> they don't not only believe in God, but they believe in the supreme male and the supreme female, eternally united and being the creative principle of life. It's really a strange conclusion. Now when you see you've got father and mother, not one woman has created a child without a man, not one man has created a child without a woman. So it's very, very close to common sense to say in divinity you must have that female and male uh, uh, manifestation as well. And then you find out these people used to worship that. They made their prayer to the Divine Mother. Divine Mother was the most cherished thing, as a matter of fact, in most tribal and Indian thoughts, in the worship of the infinite, the female gains superiority. That's the heart nut for the male chauvinistic society of today. The female gets the most importance. Maybe you have gone to Vindavan, maybe you have seen a picture of Krishna holding the feet of Radha and tears coming from his eyes. <laughs> what is this? You know? huh? What's going on there? Is that the divine? The divine male supreme powers crying at the feet of Radha? What, what message does that carry? So. Of course, we don't present that to people in the wheel of therapy, in the initial uh, stages. But if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you will reach there. Because these things are there, they are real. And when we start in, in wheel of therapy, we also do some comparative religious study. But not studying the stupidity of the organized fanatic, uh, uh, sectarian, institutionalized religions. That's what you study when you go to the university and study the comparative religion. 
You study the comparison of the different Abrahamic abuses of the world and you, you, you end up an atheist after you do that. So when we study comparative religion in Oida therapy lineage, then it is to find the nectar, the truth, the sustenance of values in human beings promoted by their spiritual understandings and traditions is a totally different thing. Even though we do go to the platforms of the uh, comparative religion, parliament of world religion, which is pretty useless, but there's another U Uri, uh, United Religious Initiative. There are a certain levels where we also should go, because if we don't go there, then they will say, oh, you Oida people, you are arrogant. But we, are, we just say, okay. Between, behind everything, there must be also some truths. Who knows where the truths? I mean, we have no problem of appreciating a Saint Francis. We have no problem of, uh, uh, of appreciating the Essene. The Essene, there were vegetarians that believed in reincarnation, and their kid was Jesus. So he propagated that amongst the Jews who were not very much keen of these things, and the, that's the beginning of that history there, whatever came from that later, no? <coughs> so we, that's why Oida therapy teaches you to be broad-minded. You cannot be narrow-minded, you cannot be sec sectarian, and you can also not be Vaishnava sectarian, because believe it or not, <coughs> Vaishnavas have an ability of being sectarian as well. And, and that doesn't look good for them. Uh, it just makes them look like, like some strange appearance there. Because if you... <coughs> if you belong to the Vasudeva Kutumbakam people, that the whole world is one family, Mother Earth is the mother, we are all one family. If you belong to that clan, then how can you eliminate one single person or, or this foolish we are saved and you are not saved, all this business, that, 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 that doesn't really fit in there. Because the, but you know why we are so easily going for that? Because we have been trained up like that. We have it in our blood. I'm better than you. Not much better, just a little bit, you know. Uh, give me a little, give me a break. Not a little bit better than you, no? Uh, <laughs> so, it's very difficult to give this up when it's in your blood, when you have to be trained up in that way. This false notion of superiority of any kind. And it can be healed. And face rather, oida therapy is exactly doing that. It heals people from narrow-mindedness and still gives them full strength and joy in their spiritual convictions. So this is something uh, I just wanted to share this with you this morning on the basis of Shraddha, that you can understand a little bit of what the thought behind it is, what, what motivates all this. How, how we approach it, how we apply it, <laughs> you never know. One of our OIDA therapists in Mexico, he has, an, he has an open invitation to go to all the jails in Mexico and he's giving classes to the inmates, to the guards and to the administration of the jails. On all levels they have full respect and he gets them all to think that how narrow-minded this makes us actually being in jail of our own mental limitation. It's appreciated. How did he get in there? Don't ask me. The other day he came to me and he came, brought the educational minister of the jail population, a, a lady who was in charge of that, and she was all fired up. Yes, this is really the language we need. Then I met Noemi Pemal. She's the founder of uh, Pedagogic 3000, which is like an attempt, something like Rudolf Steiner or Montessori, giving new frame 
to educational understanding. And when she studied about the Oida therapy, she said, that is the spiritual petrol I needed for my education. I had everything well set up, but the spirituality, I wasn't sure how to present it. So there is, a, there is a lot of content, a lot of material, and it is totally, I call Oida therapy the Linux of psychology. Because in the Linux, if, if somebody discovers something, he, he, he pulls it with all the others. So you have discovered that here's another discovery, and not a property rights, no? You have to buy this now from me. No, it's, it's, it's really like, uh, it's the open platform to share. And to share, as human beings, we all share the responsibility to make this world a better place. So that is what is behind the idea. Let's make this world a better place. Let's conquer the ignorance, which is always making an opposition and wants to make everything continue in the exploitive ways. Even though the exploitive ways are already understood to be suicidal and detrimental and difficult, but still we have nothing else, so we go ahead. We go ahead in the wrong direction. And if you do that with a, a bunch of billions of people, you're going to get some detrimental results. And they are there already, no? Maybe, maybe if you live in, an, in the Bahamas in your mansion, you don't notice what's going on uh, unless a hurricane comes to, and wipes you all off the, the, this face of the earth. So, Anyhow, my time is out, unfortunately, so I can't go much deeper in this, but I just wanted to conclude, without faith, we are nobody. Krishna says, without faith in this process, you are nobody. And faith means your inner heartfelt belief. It's not what you know. Nobody can say, I am a devotee because I know it all. I've seen Krishna, I spoke with Lord Chaitanya, I have it all down, I'm that guy. No, none of our gurus have said that. They have all taught us the art of praying and crying and not offending and helping others. And that's what we are trying to promote, that what we are trying to give to others. Now, we have a little surprise, I heard. There's, are you ready, Ambika?